Hello, welcome to A Grey Barn Rising. I'm sitting here this evening with Bootsy Beagle, as I do every evening. And uh, she's a little sleepy tonight, but she's here with, with me, with us, of course. And I'm sharing with you a cup of uh, wonderful oolong tea, uh, which is very appropriate this evening. This is a, a Chinese tea. Um, it's appropriate because I'm reading the poetry this evening of the wonderful uh, American poet John Haynes. Um, John Haynes is normally associated with Alaska, as he should be. He moved to Alaska in 1947 to Homestead. And uh, you may be thinking, well, why is Chinese tea appropriate? John Haynes' work is deeply influenced by the ancient Chinese poets. Uh, and also the very first winter he spent, the long winter nights in um, Alaska, in 1947, one of the few books he had with him uh, that he read throughout that year was the poetry of the great Chinese poet Du Fu from the Tang Dynasty. And so uh, it seems more than appropriate to be drinking a cup of uh, warm Chinese oolong tea this evening. John Haynes' work is very uh, economical and very influenced uh, by uh, imagism. He was, he's normally associated with the school of poetry called the Deep Imagists. And I think you'll hear a sparseness that in many ways reflects the landscape that John Haynes inhabited uh, all of those years in Alaska. I'm gonna read first from his uh, very first collection entitled Winter News. This is called If the Owl Calls Again. If the owl calls again at dusk from the island in the river and it's not too cold, I'll wait for the moon to rise, then take wing and glide to meet him. We will not speak, but hooded against the frost, soar above the alder flats, searching with tawny eyes. And then we'll sit in the shadowy spruce and pick the bones of careless mice while the long moon drifts toward Asia and the river mutters in its icy bed. And when morning climbs, the limbs will part without a sound, fulfilled, floating homeward as the cold world awakens. The Moosehead. John Haynes actually hunted moose in order to eat while he lived in Alaska, particularly in the early days. The Moosehead. Stripped of its horns and skin, the moose head is sinking. The eyes have fallen back from their ports into the sleepy green marrow of death. Over the bridge of the nostrils, the small pilots of the soil climb and descend. In the cabin of the skull, where the brain once floated like a ruddy captain there is just this black water and a faint glowing of phosphorus. Obviously, John Haynes writes a lot about nature and the natural world surrounding him. Uh, this is a poem about a cabin, but you'll also see the cabin is, is very much a part of nature in his vision as well. This is entitled Deserted Cabin. Here in the yellowing aspen grove on Campbell's Hill, the wind is searching a fallow garden. I remember the old man who lived here. Five years have gone by, and his house has grown to resemble his life. A shallow cave hung with old hides, rusty traps, and chains, smelling of 80 years of unwashed bedding and rotting harness. I see him sitting there now as he used to, his starved animals gathered about his bony knees. 
He talks to himself of poverty, cursing softly, jabbing a stick at the shadows. The bitterness of a soul that wanted only to walk in the sun and pick the ripening berries. It is like coming home late in the evening with a candle in your hand and meeting someone you had forgotten. The voice is strange. It is the cold autumn wind stirring the frozen grass as if some life had just passed there, bound home in the early darkness. I want to turn now to his second volume of poetry called The Stone Harp. <laughs> this is a, a funny little poem, but yet profound, um, called The Cauliflower. I wanted to be a cauliflower, all brain and ears, thinking on the origin of gardens and the divinity of him who carefully binds my leaves. With my blind roots touched by the songs of the worms and my rough throat throbbing with strange vegetable sounds, perhaps I'd feel the parting stroke of a butterfly's wing. Not like my cousins, the cabbages, whose heads, tightly folded, see and hear nothing of this world, dreaming only on the yellow and green magnificence that is hardening within them. Such a beautiful, little poem that walks the edge of humor and profundity. This is a, John Haynes doesn't, does not often write about people. There was a man in the deserted cabin poem, um, and this is a poem entitled To Vera Thompson. It's one of my very favorite John Haynes poems. Um, and even though it's written to a person, she is um, dead. He's in a, in a old military cemetery, and he's looking at her grave and imagining her and writing this poem for her. It's, uh, there's a, a parenthetical remark after the title, Buried in the Old Military Cemetery at Eagle, Alaska. Again, this is entitled to Vera Thompson. Woman whose face is a blurred map of roots, I might be buried here in you dreaming in the warmth of this late northern summer. Say I was the last soldier on the Yukon, my war fought out with leaves and thorns. Here is the field. It lies thick with horsetail, fireweed, and stubborn rose. The wagons and stables followed the troopers deep in the soil and smoke. When a summer visitor steps over the rotting sill, the barracks floor thumps with a hollow sound. Life and death grow quieter and lonelier here by the river. Summer and winter, the town sleeps and settles. History is no more than sunlight on a weathered cross. The picket fence sinks to a row of mossy shadows. The gate locks with a rusty pin. Stand there now and say that you loved me, that I will not be forgotten when a ghost wind drifts through the canyon and our years grow deep in a snow of roses and stones. to a man going blind. As you face the evenings coming on steeper and snowier, and someone you cannot see reads in a strained voice from the book of storms. Dreamlike, a jet climbs above neighboring houses, 
the streets smell of leaf smoke and gasoline. Summer was more like a curse or a scar, the accidental blow from a man of fire who carelessly turned toward you and left his handprint glowing whitely on your forehead. All the lamps in your hometown will not light the darkness growing across a landscape within you. You wait like a leaning flower and hear almost as if it were nothing the petrified rumble from a world going blind. It's another poem actually written for a person. Uh, this is, was a very political book for John Haynes. He wrote this book uh, in the mid to late 60s and uh, some of these poems really mirror and reflect the turbulence of the times. I'd like to close this evening's reading with um, a poem of his entitled, The Flight. It may happen again, this much I can always believe, when our dawn fills with frightened neighbors and the ancient car refuses to start. The gunfire of locks and shutters echoes next door to the house left open for the troops that are certain to come. We shall leave behind nothing but cemeteries and our life like a refugee cart overturned in the road, a wheel slowly spinning. I think you could probably hear in those readings the difference in energy, the difference in focus between the poems in Winter News and the poems in the Stone Harp. They both books share uh, an equal uh, sparseness and economy, but this book's uh, energy is really a little bit more outward directed beyond the immediate landscape. Uh, this book, is Winter News, is much more focused on the immediate landscape and a, a, a visionary uh, experience that John Haynes or the poet has uh, in relation to that. He's written many books. These were just the first two. He has, has a huge body of work. I would encourage you to seek it out. Uh, John Haynes is truly an American original and unfortunately not as well known as he should be. Uh, thank you so much for joining us for another episode of The Gray Barn Ride.